Perfect. Thank you very much, Justine, and thank you very much, Terry. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Doug for the wonderful dinner that we had. So as Justine was mentioning, the exact reason why we're here, we're here to talk about passive investment income changes and the impacts on your corporation. If you think the presentation is going to give you a hot stock tip, this is not what the presentation is about. So M&P, a little bit of uh, information about us. We were founded in 1958 in Brandon, Manitoba of all places. Uh, we're the fifth largest professional accounting tax and business consulting firm in Canada. Our London office itself actually merged with MNP back in uh, January 2008, so that we've been with them for about uh, 17 months now. We have more than 70 offices located across the country in both urban and rural markets. So for example, in our region, we have offices in Sarnia, Arcona, Strathroy, Stratford, London, and Clinton. <coughs> And we have more than 4,500 team members and over 800 partners that now work in the MNP uh, family. So who am I? So Justine mentioned, I'm Brandon Gilbert. I'm a CPA, CA, uh, got that in 2008. I have a bachelor's in mathematics, please ignore that, I don't use it anymore. And I have a master's of accounting from the University of Western Ontario. I'm the partner here in, uh, in Southwestern Ontario's office for mainly based in London, but I'm also the regional professionals niche leader which means my focus and my oversight is for professionals across southwestern Ontario. My primary practice focus, as mentioned, is physicians and dentists, and they form about 95% of my practice. I started at the firm back when it was Kime Mills Dunlop in 2003, so January 2003, so Justine made me sound old, and I've been around a while. I think I've been doing accounting for almost half of my life now. I'm married to my wife Donna for almost 10 years. That anniversary is on June the 27th. I do remember that. Uh, she's also a CPA CA, which uh, please hold the boring jokes aside. I have two sons, Brody and Chase, so we have a very active household. So what are we here to talk about? First thing that we're here to talk about are professional corporations or corporations in general still useful. As you see there, big bold letters, yes. The answer is yes. We'll go through it quickly though. There's deferral of tax and there's a few other reasons. Number two, we're going to talk about tax on passive investment income. So that's the main reason why we're here. What is passive investment income? What is the SBD limit, so the small business deduction limit? And what are the changes to refundable dividend tax on hand? Third, planning thoughts. So it's not just, here's the rules, let's talk about a little bit about, here's some ideas about the planning that go along with this and what the impacts are gonna be. Investment strategies, compensation expense strategies, RSPs and IPPs, a little bit about life insurance and just some other bright ideas. Top tax rates. So one thing that's important as we go through these presentations is always to understand what's the top tax rate in a particular province that we're dealing with on both a corporation level and on a personal level. So in the, in the first part, we have business or practice income up to $500,000. So $500,000 is the traditional small business deduction limit. Tax rate for the corporation, 12.5% on active income. So we are actually doing something active to earn it. Highest personal tax rate on non-eligible dividends, 47.4%. Please feel free to choke on your water. Business or practice income over $500,000. Corporate net tax rate, 26.5%. So you see the corporate rate goes up, but if you pay out a dividend from that high rate income, you get eligible dividend treatment, 39.34%. So passive investment income, the deferral advantage. And this is a lot of what people start to talk about is say, well, what happens with, for tax purposes if I actually save money within my corporation? What this slide is designed to show you is if we had $100,000 available within a corporation, we pay corporate tax first, unincorporated, incorporated. We have income after tax and then potentially after tax income. So on the unincorporated side, we have hundred grand of business income. $53,500 of tax, which is the general personal tax rate at the top end, not on dividends, but on active income. We have income from after tax of $46,500. We have no more personal tax, so it's $46,500 in your pocket. Next, incorporated, $100,000 of income, $12,500 of tax, $87,500 left over. If you stopped there and we said, okay, what do we have to invest personally? we have 46.5. Corporately, 
we have 87,500. So if we were able to invest that versus that, we have a fairly significant advantage. If you decided to take it out in the same year, you would pay that much personal tax and you would actually end up with less money if you float it all through the corporation. So a common question I'm getting asked now is if I, if I have a corporation, I take everything else, everything out of it, is it worth it? My answer is typically no, unless there's some other reason. If we have an ability to save in the corporation, we have an ability, which leads us to this slide. So this slide starts to get into the little bit more of a complex world where we start to add investment income. And the other thing that we've assumed is that now that we have a corporation, we have additional costs of running the corporation. It's more complex, there's more banking fees, there's more accounting, there's more legal fees associated with running it. So we have a little bit less income, 100 versus 95. We have tax on the incorporated, but then we get a bit of investment income. So we've reinvested this $83,100. We have $84,800. If we stopped there, everything would be fine. We'd continue to build and accumulate money. What this scenario says is, let's say we did something ridiculous again. We said, we're just going to take everything out. If we took everything out after year one, we would actually have a disadvantage for having the corporation. But where it's important, year 10. Again, if we did something ridiculous, took every single penny of the million dollars out, we would have an $8,200 advantage. After 20 years, we would have a $126,000 advantage. What these slides are designed to show you is even if we saved money in the corporation and then stripped out every single penny in the future, the corporation still has an advantage over time. Where it becomes a little bit more interesting is to say, well, what if we didn't pay the highest personal tax rate when we took the money out of the corporation? So in this case, the tax deferral advantage, that $126,000, suddenly can become an income splitting advantage. So saving tax today when we have a high rate of personal tax, taking it out sometime in the future when we have a lower rate of personal tax. More commonly when we see this is retirement. But it's also possible if we have a maternity or a parental or a, or a paternal leave and people just wanted to smooth some income through the years, the advantage, of course, gets better. If our tax rates, personally, are lower on average, the advantage gets even better. And one thing I am going to mention is they still have rules under tax on split income, which is the only time I'm going to really talk about it, is once you're age 65, if you have a spouse, you have the ability to take those dividends, which were lost, and start to split income with your spouse again. So not necessarily your own tax rates, but your spouse's tax returns as well. So of course, where this shows a little bit better is if we have a numerical example. We have after-tax personal cash advantage of 30%. So instead of our 47.4% that I had on the other slides as the let's take it all out at the top rate, what if we took it out as an average of 30%? One year, $12,000 advantage. To year 10, 185. Year 20, 565,000. 30% as an average tax rate, we're taking out $207,000 of dividends, cash dividends. We'd pay about $62,000 a tax, so there's our 30%. And we'd have $145,000 in your pocket, which is $12,100 per month, roughly, in your pocket every month at an average tax rate of 30%. Now, probably a lot of people in the room are saying, yeah, $12,000 per month, I can live on that. If there's no mortgage, if we don't have to worry about anything else, $12,000 a month is not too bad. Of course, if we can income split with a spouse, it gets a little bit better. If our tax rate is less than 30% on average, it gets a little bit better. So these are where we're looking at it. And if you remember, my scenario was $100,000 per year over 20 years, and we have a half a million dollar example. In this case, I did use the bachelor math with simple things and said, math seems to work. Other reasons why the PC still makes sense. So non-deductible expenses are paid from 12.5% corporate taxed dollars instead of from being paid at 53.5% or 47.4% taxed personal dollars. So life insurance and the 50% deductible portion of meals are the two typical examples we use. 
office and home or other deductions where they're possible for a corporation and they'd be restricted for you as an individual. Income smoothing, as I mentioned, for a sabbatical or for a parental leave. Budgeting of personal cash flow and forced savings. The funny thing is when I talk with a lot of my younger physicians right now, personal cash flow budgeting <coughs> ends up being one of the most important discussions that I end up having. Because people say, here's what I want to live on. If I have all this money coming in, I'm just going to spend it. If I have something that puts the brakes on in the middle and we say the corporation's going to have all this money, we're going to distribute to you 10000 per month. So your budget is 10000 per month. A lot of people appreciate that budgeting aspect of what a corporation has. And for certain professional corporations, there are scientific research credits that are enhanced with a corporation compared with as an individual. So yes, PCs still do make a lot of sense. Mainly though, when we're looking at it, that we have a savings ability with the corporations. So I'm going to pause there and just say, does anyone have any questions about that first section from the audience? So the question for Facebook Live is, if, you, if uh, you hit age 65, does it matter what the age of your spouse is? And the answer is no. You could have a 30-year-old spouse, and as long as you are 65, you can ink some split. The opposite is also true. If your spouse is over 65, some people have said, oh, now that they're over 65, we can income split. The answer is no. It has to be who the primary active person in the corporation is that's 65. Great question. All right. So the next, next part that we're going to run through is, of course, tax on passive investment income. So first thing that we go through is, is the why. Why did the government do this? Well, of course, the government was concerned that the corporate tax deferral, so those big numbers that I was showing you, provides an unfair advantage to incorporated business owners. And that the corporate tax rates is shown, Ontario, 12.5%, corporate rate, 53.5%, top rate on the same active income. There is a 41% differential between those that we could save money within the corporation. The corporation then has more money to invest. It grows faster. They have compounding of income. And it, it's at a higher level than someone who has personal investments could possibly earn and compound and grow. So it was originally proposed to increase the tax on the corporate investment income to eliminate the tax deferral. And that came from a white paper, a discussion paper from the Department of Finance in July 2017. Panic buttons were hit, everyone freaked out, the government backed off a little bit and they rejigged how they were going to do it. As part of that as well, in the original discussion paper, they talked about grandfathering certain investments and certain balances. Under the new rules that they have implemented, there is no grandfathering of existing investments. If you have $2 million of investments and it's kicking out um, $100,000 a year of dividends, that $200,000 a year of dividends is subject to the new rules. So the big two changes. Ability to reduce, sorry, reduce the ability to claim that low 12.5% tax on small business income where the corporate investment income exceeds 50000 And they came up with the $50,000 number where they said, if you have a million dollars and you earn 5%, we're going to say that's reasonable for you to build up for some sort of an investment that you need in the future. So if you're a manufacturer and you need to build a, buy a million dollar piece of equipment and it takes you five years to build up to this dollar value, we're going to let you earn that investment income and we're not going to penalize you because of that. Once you go above this magical threshold, now we're going to start to hit you with tax. The second part of it, which is a little bit more difficult to understand, but if, is impacting everyone from dollar number one of investment income, is the refundability of taxes on investment income has been realigned to limit the refund mechanism. Refundable dividend tax on hand, so RDTOH. I will explain it as best I can. So, you'll see there's a lot of words on this particular slide, and my goal is not to go through all of the detail on this particular slide, but to give you a little bit of a, an appreciation of the hamster wheel that we have to run on sometimes to get to an answer 
of what is passive income. So when passive income comes into the Income Tax Act, CRA actually describes it as passive income is everything that is not active income. So instead we say we have a definition of what is active income. And the definition subsection is 125.7. It's an exciting read. You should look at it. Uh, any corporate income from the year from the active business income, including income for the year pertaining to or incident to that business. What does that mean? So let's say you had a real estate holding company that owns a building and you have your practice in that building. So you own both corporations. If Practice Corp rents from Rental Corp, the rental income, which typically would be passive income, is deemed to be active because it's related to your business. If that rental corp rents that to, let's say, rents the building to another physician and you don't, you don't occupy it at all, that is not related to your business and it is passive income. Active business income does not include income or loss from a source that is property unless it's used to sustain the active business income. So if you have the million dollars in the bank account and you need a million dollars where you turn over a million dollars of expenses every month and you happen to earn some interest on it, that is active. If you have a million dollars in a savings account and your monthly expenses are $10,000, the interest on the million dollars not related to your active practice, you have excess capital. CRA, as part of this process, introduced a new definition for tax on passive investment income called adjusted aggregate investment income. And you're going to hear me refer to it as AAII under the TOPI or tax on passive investment income rules. Now, what's better is we have a graph. And we say, here's really the things that are important to know about what's passive income. Certain facts, certain circumstances are different, but at the baseline of it, we have taxable capital gains on investment assets that you sell. Passive interest, rent, royalty, and other investment income. Foreign investment income, not from affiliates. So if you happen to have an operating company in the US that pays your Canadian company dividends, that's an affiliate. Portfolio dividends. RBC, Bell Canada, Rogers, any of those investment portfolios. We then subtract costs associated with the AAII. Allowable capital losses on investments sold in the current year. If you had losses carried forward from a previous year, doesn't impact the AAII calculation. Investment expenses, so fees, interest, other. So if you pay an investment management firm for managing your money, that cost can be deducted from the in income. And then we have oh, allowable capital losses of the current year, which I apparently duplicated. What it excludes, so there's certain things where AAII says we're not even going to include this in the calculation. Interest in capital gains from the active or business assets. Dividends from connected corporations, so essentially one's that are controlled by you or a family member. Unrealized portfolio gains. So if you bought Apple back in the late 90s and it's gone up in value, whatever, 100% or 100,000% right now, if you haven't sold it, it doesn't affect it. Once you sell it is when it affects it. And then investment income from an exempt life insurance policy. So. The way the small business deduction limit is affected is the small business deduction limit, that $500,000 where we get the 12.5%, is reduced by $5 for every $1 of investment income that you earned last year. So what's interesting about these rules is they came into effect February 27, 2018. The 2019 corporate year ends are really the first year ends that are being affected by these rules. And they base the calculation on your investment income from 2018, though. So the, the example I have is if we have AAII of $70,000, so we're $20,000 above that $50,000 threshold, your small business deduction limit is reduced by $100,000. So $20,000 above times five, $100,000. So our new small business deduction limit, $400,000. If you had $500,000 of income, 400 of it is at 
100,000 of it is at a higher tax rate. Small business deduction limit is eliminated at $150,000. Simple math again, 150 AAII, take off the 50 you're allowed, $100,000 left times five, goodbye small business deduction limit. The, but if you have the higher rate of corporate tax apply, it generates what's called GRIP, general rate income pool. General rate income pool is what creates the eligible dividends. So if you remember way back from the start, we had a 39.34% top tax rate on eligible dividends, which was lower than the 47.4%. That's where it starts to be impacted, is that if you pay the higher rate, you get cheaper taxed personal dividends when you take them out. So there is a chart. And the chart says if Ontario had adopted the rules. And what's important to see here is that if we had $150,000 of investment income and we had $500,000 of active income, the extra tax the corporation would have paid would be $70,000. So it's a much higher tax rate. But Ontario decided not to adopt the federal rules, which was really curious. The Ontario Liberal government, before it was replaced, said, yeah, we're going to adopt it. When the Conservatives came into power, they said, nah, that's not fair for Ontario small businesses. We're not going to adopt it. So the $150,000 of active in or investment income, $500,000 of active income, we would pay $30,000 more tax. So here's our new rates. So it's not the 26.5% tax rate on business net income over $500,000. We actually have a middle tax rate now. It's 18.5%. So on any of that income where we've had clawed back small business deduction limit, we're paying an 18.5% corporate tax rate, which is about 6% higher than our small business rate. So now you're wondering, if you have active income which is approaching the thresholds, one of the questions I'm getting asked is, how much can I earn of investment income before I start to get clawed back? So AAII of, let's say we have an example of $300,000 of active income. So this is after all the expenses and we're left with $300,000 that we're going to pay tax on. And we had $90,000 of AAII from last year. The ground down small business deduction limit is $300,000 because 90,000, less 50, 40,000, times five, 200,000, our small business deduction limit is equal to our active income. So there's nothing special we have to do in that year. We are already gonna continue to get that 12.5% corporate tax rate. 400,000 of active income allows $70,000 of investment income the previous year. 200,000 is 110,000. So for some of the people in the room, if you don't have the higher amounts of active income, the rules may not affect you for a number of years. But what if math can show us that the reduced small business deduction limit can actually save us tax? And this is a weird concept, and I actually figured this out on the weekend. I was going through the presentation, and there's been other papers and other things written. I just hadn't read them because of tax season. So what's an odd thing that happens is, let's assume we had $100,000, it seems to be my theme of active income, impacted by the lower small business deduction rate. So we're being forced into paying that 18.5% corporate rate. So we pay $18,500 on the 100 grand. We have 81,500 left. And we get $72,000 added to this notional GRIP account with Canada Revenue Agency. The corporation pays out a dividend. You say, I want the money. 72,000 of it is an eligible dividend. 9,500, non-eligible dividend. Tax, total tax, 28,325 plus $4,500 personally. So now our combined tax is the 18,5 plus these two taxes. Money in your pocket. So after we've flowed through this 100 grand, paid all the tax to CRA, we have cash in our pocket, $48,675, again, assuming the top, top tax rates. At which point you're going, oh gosh, that's terrible, it's $48,675. Tax rate, 51.33%.
If we took the same income at the small business deduction limit, $100,000, 12.5% tax rate, top tax rate on non-eligible dividends, we have $46,000 in our pocket, which is roughly uh, $2,700 tax savings. And you're going, why? Well, the reason why is the federal rules determine what gets added to this eligible dividend, the low taxed personal dividend rules. The provincial government said, we're not going to charge extra tax. So integration tells us that if we had a dollar of tax through corp, through the small business limit, a dollar of tax through the high business limit, or a dollar of tax personally, our money in our pocket should be the same. Because Ontario decided not to adopt these rules, they messed it up. They actually made it better. It's a really odd thing. When we first heard about the rules and we thought that Ontario was going to adopt them, they were going to be that cost. Everyone was going to pay more money as soon as they accumulated more investment income. Now, we're actually not so sure. Now, $2,700 though, was the math oversimplified? And the answer is yes. That math was based on a very, very simple scenario. And if only we lived in that perfect tax planning world. In the real world though, when we're talking about investment income of that level, we have timing of dividends and paying the exact amount of grip. In this case, I calculated it to the penny. In the real world, I have no idea what that is until we actually get into the tax return. The amount of the active income, or the amount of the aggregate in adjusted um, investment income, what are the components of it? Are there dividends? Are there capital gains? Are there investment income? Is it foreign income? And how do we compensate ourselves? Compensate ourselves by salary, bonus, dividends, other means? Federal government could legislate a grip change for Ontario. We have no idea. That's always a possibility where they say, we don't like the fact you didn't adopt this. We're going to change the rules for you. Super complex if they did that because other provinces have adopted the rules. And of course, the other topi change that I'd mentioned was RDTOH. So how does that have an impact? And what is RDTOH? So I'm going to pause there because we're going to switch to a different topic. We talked about the small business deduction limit impact. What questions do you have about that section of the presentation? Is everyone still awake? <laughs> Perfect. Nick, get off your phone. So, if your investments grow within the corporation itself, you do not take money out of it. So does that uh, call, is it called uh, passive income? Or does it have any tax implications? <clears throat> Yes, so the question is, if you have investments within the corporation that you don't take out, you allow them to continue to grow, what, what impact is that? Is that passive income? The answer is yes. And that's where it's the compound income that we have. So let's say in a year we earned $50,000 of investment income on a million dollar portfolio, then we reinvested that within the corporation, taking off a little bit of corporate tax. So we have then a million forty thousand dollars let's say, to reinvest. That million forty thousand might generate fifty-two thousand dollars of investment income, so it just compounds and grows and builds. But each of those years, with the aggregate investment income test, it's an individual year test. So this year, if you had fifty thousand of income, no impact. If next year you had fifty-two, impacted. Next year you have forty-eight, not impacted. And it's an individual year test. But as that grows, it's it's actually very difficult to have CRA count your investment income as active income. And in a lot of cases, I would argue, you don't want them to treat your investment income as active income. Because then there's other problems with, let's say, capital gains. Capital gains, traditionally 50% taxable. So if you had a $100,000 capital gain, only $50,000 goes on your corporate tax return. If it's active income, $100,000 goes on your corporate tax return. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Yes, sir. So if you had bought Apple and you did nothing with the stock and you closed your corporation because you retired from taxes, what happens then? So you, you have no money in, no money out. What you invested was 10,000, it's now you know, 10 million, let's just say, when you turn 65 and you retire. Yep. What happens then? So what happens then is if you decide to cash in on the Apple stock and suddenly convert in a $10 million capital gain, a couple of interesting things happen. One thing is, uh, under the current tax regimes, there's something called a capital dividend account. 
So the 50% taxable portion of the capital gains I mentioned, the other 50%, which the corporation doesn't pay tax on, it's not fair to have that money trapped within the corporation itself. So that other half, you can declare what's called a capital dividend, which is actually a tax-free distribution to you. There's a couple more steps to it, but it's nice to have that. That other, that other $5 million of the taxable capital gain, if you trigger that, the following year, you would have an AAII inclusion of $5 million. But you have no active income anymore. So your small business deduction rate, you don't care about anymore because you don't have anything, any active income to have that tax rate. So then it just falls under the normal tax rules for the investment income itself. So that is one of the strategies is, is to say if we have st stocks with gains and you're approaching retirement and you know that if you sold them and you have no other reason why you would sell them, if you knew if you sold them we would suddenly have a tax problem on your active income, you may choose to keep the pregnant gains, unrealized gains, until you actually retire. But, as I'd mentioned with the other slide, if there may be an advantage to putting you offside to actually create the eligible dividends. And that's where the complexities of the calculations start to come in. But the, generally for a lot of our clients, they're just saying, we're gonna wait, leave the gains unrealized until we retire. Great question. So, refundable tax. So the former refundable tax regime, what was it? First, it was designed that tax investment income at roughly the same personal tax rate as you would have as an individual, even though it was retained within the corporation. So there was a mechanism to charge a, a amount of tax now, but it would refund you the tax if you flowed through that dividend to an individual taxpayer. So the simplest example I have is we received a dividend from Royal Bank of Canada for $10,000. Refundable tax on that, if we didn't distribute a dollar of dividend, would be $3,833. So this year, the corporation would pay $3,833 of tax. Next year, you say, I'd like to take out a dividend. You take out $10,000 of cash. Siri says, great, now you've transferred that tax liability to you as an individual we will give back the corporation the $3,833. So for this dividend from RBC, the corporation in the middle ultimately paid no tax. So it's a temporary, it's a holding tax, but it's refundable. Theoretically, there should be no difference in the tax paid personally or corporately. Practically, there actually is. So as I mentioned near the start of the presentation, there's two types of dividends. Eligible, which originate from profits at the higher corporate tax rates, and non-eligible, which originate from the small business deduction tax rate. The attempt by the Department of Finance is for the total corporate tax paid to be equal. So corporate general tax plus personal tax on eligible dividends roughly equals small business tax paid plus personal tax on non-eligible dividends, which roughly equals the personal tax rate you'd ultimately pay on the investments. So formerly, and this is where it becomes more interesting, the corporation was refunded the RDTOH for either type of dividend that was paid. Didn't matter if you paid an eligible one, you'd get it back. Non-eligible, you'd get it back. The new regime, they're taking that refundable tax pool and they're saying this pool is eligible, this pool is non-eligible. So if you want to get back eligible refundable tax, you either pay an eligible or a non-eligible dividend, either one. But to get back the non-eligible, the higher tax rate refundable tax, it's only refunded if you pay non-eligible dividends. There's some transitional rules to convert them and it's actually very difficult to perfectly recover RDTOH in this planning. Do I have a slide on it? Nope. So a lot of what it is is imagine if we had two types of investment income. Interest income on one hand, eligible dividends on the other. And let's say we wanted to distribute a $10,000 dividend that year to you as an individual. 
the tax that we would pay on the $10,000 of interest income that would be refundable would be about $3,000. The tax we would pay for our D2H for the eligible dividend, as I mentioned, about $3,800. If we paid a $10,000 non-eligible dividend, we would get back either one of those. Wouldn't matter, wouldn't care. If we paid a $10,000 eligible dividend and we only had earned interest income, that $3,000 of temporary tax, we wouldn't get back. CRA would keep it until the point we paid a non-eligible dividend. So it creates a disconnect between the cash coming out of the corporation and the tax refund that comes from CRA for RDTOH. So the flow through rates, so someone smarter than I created this slide to say best case pre-change rule, combined corporate and personal tax rate on investment income, 54%, which is roughly equal to the 53.5% personal rate. Poorly managed post rule change, 60% as a marginal tax rate, well managed about 55 and a half. So you could start to see some of the corporations losing out on some of the taxes. In some cases it could be a permanent loss in taxes because of these eligible versus not non-eligible refundable tax rules. So it's, it's this part of it, it's the most difficult part of it to understand and it really relies on your accountants to think about it and to do some calculations, say here's what are the recommendations are. But again, it's very difficult to do those calculations because it, we're partly guessing what the investment income is going to be for the year. And as we all know, we can never perfectly predict what that's going to be. Now, of course, when they bring in these rules, they also bring in anti-avoidance rules. So one of the things is we have associated corporations. They have to combine their, their tax limits. So the simplest way to explain this is, uh, let's say we had those rental corporation and we had the active corporation as a PC. Both of them had a million dollar of portfolios. Both of them earned $50,000 of investment income. Under the anti-avoidance rules, if those corporations are tied together or associated for tax purposes, your AAII is not 50,000 and 50,000, it's 100,000 that gets applied to Corporation A and applied the same amount to Corporation B. And then another example that we have is if one of them has investments, the, the other one's paying the dividends, we could actually get into one of those RDTOH problems where one of them gets back, would be expecting to get back a refund, but the other corporations paid the dividend and there's no refund that comes back from those corporations. Again, that's a much more involvement with your accountants to try to figure out if you have any type of problem like that. The other anti-avoidance rule is they actually take it down another step. So associated, you have to meet some fairly high tests to say there's control, share ownership tests. With related corporations, it's more based on your family. So the anti-avoidance rule they put in is that we, if we have corporation A, and it says, ooh, I'm accumulating money too fast. So I'm going to take this money. I'm going to lend it to my sister's corporation. I'm going to charge her 1%. I'm going to be a nice brother. As lending it across, sister's corporation now says, I'm going to invest this. I'm going to earn $100,000 a year of investment income. What CRA says is if you did that transfer, that loan, with the intention to reduce your aggregate investment income, we're going to ignore the fact that they're not associated. We're going to look and say, sister, brother, you're related. So we're going to now say that aggregate investment income of your sister's corporation, which you have nothing else to do with other than loan, you have to count part of that aggregate investment income on your tax return and guess what? You're going to pay a higher tax rate on your income as well. So part of the reason I, I bring this up is sometimes they say, well, it's, it's starting to come up because of the tax on split income rules. And we said, what if we formed Corporation B? I'm going to take the money in mine. I'm going to have my wife own the shares of that one. I'm going to own the shares of this one. I'm going to loan the money across. It's going to earn the investment income. We each get this. 
$50,000 aggregate investment income limit? No. So who are related people? Spouse, parent, child, sister, brother, grandchild, grandparents, steps, and in-laws for all of those sames. So it's actually a fairly wide net of who are related persons with corporations. If you, don't, if you never transfer, if you never loan, if you never do anything, if you're not nice to your sister, these rules won't apply. But they're trying to design it to say, we know people are going to do it, so we're going to try to stop it. RDTOH. What questions do, does anyone have about RDTOH before we get into the more important part? Yes, sir. So if a uh, husband wife both are, are present in your professional corporation, and they have one corporation, yep. does it make sense to have two separate in this scenario uh, to decrease the passive income tax? Potentially, yes, uh, but also potentially no, and, and you'll have to, I have, unfortunately I have to give a wishy-washy answer on it. So the question for Facebook was if we have two, two physicians in a corporation, would it make sense to split it into two separate corporations and to have our own aggregate investment income test for each? Yes, theoretically you can do that. So you can have that separation, you can take the corporation, you can literally tear it apart through a, through a butterfly transaction or through another set of tax transactions. A, it can be expensive to actually do that transaction to separate it properly. And now we have two sets of costs for running the corporation, and we have more complexity for running the corporation. Two investment accounts, two bank accounts, more credit cards, more of a lot of stuff. You would get more access to the small business deduction limit. You may grow the assets of the corporation faster, but we have to understand that there's costs of doing that. The no side is, and it goes back to that, there may be cases where we have people who want to to actually trigger the new rules and to build up investment income faster to try to take advantage of that differential of tax where we're paying 18.5% but we can take out those eligible dividends at a lower tax rate and potentially have less tax overall. So it's more of a calculation problem and a, a question of how risk averse are you, how complicated do you want to have your financial affairs than a yes no answer unfortunately. Planning ideas. So what if we don't want to bury our hands in the sand? Planning thoughts, I'm going to run through them. First, investment income management or strategy. And of course, this would be the idea of if we wanted to try to get that small business deduction limit. Investment and tax advisors should work together for optimal results. But, and however, don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. So taxes in the grand scheme of things, but uh, instead of the potential for the investment returns, don't get so focused on the tax that you lose out on an opportunity to earn more investment income and be better off financially because of that. Consider targeting your annual investment income by triggering capital gains as the rules are based on the realized investment income. So let's give the example. We had $30,000 of investment income. We know we have a $50,000 limit before we're impacted by it. You may choose to sell investments to trigger a $20,000 taxable capital gain and get to that $50,000 limit. What it means is you've converted more of that portfolio to a higher tax base and you might not have it where one year you have $30,000 of income, the next year you have 70 and you get to start to go offside. Strategically realize capital losses against tr triggered capital gains. So if you sell the winners, sell the dogs. Um, consider investing in capital gain or return of capital producing assets instead of ones that have the dividends, the foreign income, and the interest or other investment income. So if you have a portfolio that says we're going to give you a return of capital of $10,000 instead of a taxable dividend, that return of capital has no impact on your current year's AAII. Consider investments that are exempt from AAII. Unrealized capital gains is the example with Apple. Life insurance, individual pension plans, and are all of your reasonable expenses being charged against your investment income? So if you're seeking advice from the investment management company, is that actually being deducted against your AAII according to those calculations I went through earlier? Can a, oh, 
Next one would be compensation and expense strategies. So can corporate income be forced below small business deduction limit that's been reduced by TOPI? So our example here, again, 300,000 of net active income. We had $100,000 of AAII last year. Our ground down small business limit is 250,000. So in theory, 50 grand would be charged at that 18.5% rate. Could we find $50,000 of additional expenses to get the active net income down below the 250,000? And of course, as I'd mentioned, consider that there may be a planning advantage to not do that. But consider paying a salary instead of dividends. So part of the way that we can force the income of the corporation down is you can, you're allowed to declare or accrue a bonus for salary at your year end, take it as an expense for that year end, but wait to pay it later. And the later in our case is it has to be paid within 180 days. Or practically, we always use 179 to just give us a day of safety. If the year end is after July the 6th, you can take that 180 days and it actually allows us to pay that bonus the next calendar year, which could be part of your personal tax planning, not just your corporate tax planning. But you can pay family members a reasonable salary. So if you'd been compensating with the dividends before and they actually do work for the corporation, and you want to pay them something, that salary paid to a family member is an expense to the corporation. But of course, whenever we get into planning sides, there's problems. Beware CPP duplication if you have salaries from two different sources. RDTOH recovery may not make sense from those other calculations with refundable tax and the eligible and non-eligible pools. And then the payroll deduction remittance requirements, that they have very hefty penalties if you miss one of those. Review your expenses. Again, that are being deducted against your corporate income to ensure that all the possible expenses are actually being deducted, keeping track of things. Some clients may choose to be more aggressive about their expense deductions. We said, well, before, I wouldn't really do that. It was kind of on the, on the fence whether it was deductible against my business income or not. Some of them are now going, you know what? CRA changed the rules. I'm going to be more aggressive. I'm going to deduct that cost that was on the, on the fence. But, of course, we have to be aware of CRA audit risk. So, if you have more aggressive positions and CRA chooses to audit you, you have to be prepared to justify your position. One point, though, is don't just spend money to get the tax deduction. Because if you spend $1,000 on an expense, the $1,000 is gone. If you'd kept that $1,000 within the corporation and paid tax on it, Ultimately, under the calculations, you'd have $480 or $460 or more that you could actually have in the future for you. If you spend it, it's gone. RSPs and IPPs. So one of the things with RSPs is part of what I've done over a lot of my career is we split our investments into different buckets. We have RSP bucket and we can have a professional corporation bucket. And having those grow and build makes everyone better. So one of the ideas is if you have and are generating RSP room, if you take money out of the corporation, put it into your RSP, any of the investment income that's earned in the RSP doesn't affect the aggregate investment income test. So in the example I have here, if we have 25,000 a year of RSP room, we withdraw 25 grand from the corporation, so 25 grand of income, 25,000 RSP deduction, no additional personal income. If we had a 4% return on that same 25,000 invested within the corporation, $1,000 AAII, $5,000 small business deduction limit. Over a period of 10 years, 20 years, that number gets fairly significant. What it requires though, is we have to have a salary. We have to have earned income of some sort. So if you've been compensating yourself over all the years with just dividends, you wouldn't accumulate RSP room. And if you continue to compensate with dividends, you wouldn't generate new RSP room. RSPs, simple to administer, same as any other investment. Funds are withdrawn at your discretion. Eligible for pension splitting on personal tax returns, subject to certain age and other restrictions. And if you're married, your RSP deduction limit could be used to contribute to a spousal RSP 
which is a form of income splitting, where if, let's say I do it with my wife, which I do, I take my limit, invest it in her hands, I have my corporation, and for whatever reason, the income splitting rules with corporations go away at age 65, I hopefully have a bunch of money built up in my corporation that I use as my retirement taxable income. She has a bunch of money in her own and this spousal RSP, which then she uses for her own retirement income. But the thing with spousal RSPs is there's certain timelines you have to follow for income attribution. <coughs> IPPs, so you've heard presentations, you've seen presentations about them. Because of these tax on passive income rules, IPPs have come back in and are a little bit stronger of an argument. So advantages, you can have a past service contribution. So the corporation actually funds a big chunk of a startup of your, pass of your pension. And that's a deduction to the corporation, which reduces the active income. IPPs typically have a higher contribution limit. Interest borrowed is deductible against the corporate income. IPPs, because they have bigger contributions, typically grow to a bigger size. The IPP funds remove that cash from the corporate investments, which again reduces that AAII, same as RSPs. IPPs are creditor protected in Ontario, where generally RSPs are not yet. Every so often there's a private member's bill that comes up and it just hasn't gotten through yet to creditor protect RSPs. And it's eligible for pension splitting on the tax return with less restrictions than RSPs, but there's disadvantages. IPPs are generally more costly to administer and establish. They're more complex, so will you understand them still when you're retired? They're mandatory annual contributions with possible lump sum top-ups if the pension is found to be underfunded by an actuary. They're hard but not impossible to unwind, but usually if you unwind one, there's a heavy personal tax cost. You have to have received salary in previous years to get this top-up past service contribution. When, we, when we've looked at them in the past, we usually look at them and say, if you're age 40 and younger, the math doesn't work as well as age 40 and over. You can't contribute your IPP room to a spousal IPP. So we have the spousal RSP build up these pools in different people's hands with the IPP. If you're the worker, you're the one who has the pension. You can pension split it, as I mentioned, but it can create an imbalance in your retirement income. And the spousal RSP contribution, so as I mentioned, I do spousal RSPs. In my case, it grinds down that past service pension. I can't put as big an amount in if I decided to start an IPP. Life insurance. You've heard about this before. So. Life insurance, as I mentioned, the investment income that's earned within an exempt life insurance policy is not included in the calculations for AAII. But of course, with life insurance, if you're not dealing with as reputable a company as Avitz Insurance, you have to think insurance need and long-term financial goals. Cash, do you have the cash actually available to invest in the policy and continue to fund it in the future to keep the life insurance in force. What are the costs within the insurance policy? So sometimes what you don't understand is that the cost for investing within the insurance policy might be higher than investing outside. So if you had a pool of mutual funds you can invest in, the management fees might be two and a half, three percent versus as an individual or as a corporation, you might invest it in ETFs at half a percent. So some of those costs come into play. And then alternative investment returns, if you chose to take that money, invest it somewhere else. Terry and Justine have shown a lot over the years to say, here's the alternatives, here's life insurance. Life insurance generally still wins and it's a good, good reason, but there's usually, there's actually not usual, there is always an insurance need or a long-term goal with the insurance policies that Zavitz puts in. Any other bright ideas? So some of the bright ideas, active assets, if you happen to be in a position where you say, yeah, I rent my building right now, I think I'd like to own one, have my own piece of property. If you own that and it's your own owner occupied, the cash you used for it, it's not passive, it's part of active. So you could take a pool of money out, still have it grow in value with the value of real estate, but it doesn't impact your active assets. It doesn't, sorry, it doesn't impact your aggregate 
um, investment income. Equipment or software upgrades that increase your profitability. And of course, only invest if it makes business sense. Back to my $1,000 expense, expense example, if you spend the 1000 bucks, gets you nothing, goodbye $1,000. Capital gains planning. So this is one that takes a little bit more explanation, but it's, it's roughly owners of private corporations can convert their dividends into capital gains which are taxed at the lower rate. So I'd mentioned in that example with Apple about the capital dividend account, and that's part of what this planning is. The proposals from July said we're going to get rid of this. In October, because of backlash, not from professionals, but from farmers, the government abandoned it. But when they abandoned it, they said, we're going to come back to it. And in 2019 budget that just came at the end of March, which was a very boring budget, thankfully, they said that they're going to restart their consultations to see if they can get rid of part of this planning. The savings in some cases are quite substantial. The advisory fees, though, because it's a complex transaction, are quite costly. And typically, you wouldn't implement it, or we wouldn't implement it, recommend it, unless you had a million dollars of value you could do it with. And CRA is likely to audit the paperwork associated with the transaction. The tax in this case is also prepaid. So now that you've read all this, you're going, what in the heck are you talking about? <laughs> The rough way that it works is, let's say we had $2 million. We would form a structure where the money would move over to a corporation, would generate a capital dividend, so all of a sudden we could take out a $1 million tax-free. As part of that transaction, though, the second corporation pays tax now on generating the capital dividend, or generating the capital gain. When we start to run the numbers and we say the top tax rate for capital gains is 26.5% roughly, top tax rate for eligible dividends is 47%, that math can turn into some fairly substantial numbers. But again, the costs are quite high to do it. Examples where it can be beneficial, if you're extracting existing investments from the corporation, then you want to rebuild your existing portfolio to avoid the small business deduction limit. If you want to use lower taxed money to pay for a line of credit or a mortgage or a kid's education, I had an example of one of my clients in Toronto where we did this, and all of a sudden, all the, the concerns they had about funding their kid's college and final private school years went away. Use the capital dividend to buy out family member shareholders who might otherwise pay tax at high rates. So because of these new tax on split income rules, we have some corporations where they got trapped with having participating shares, which are ones that hold value, owned by family members, where the only way to get rid of them is to pay high tax rate dividends. And to use it as part of end of life planning to increase your estate value. So it's unfortunately morbid, but if you, if you know that you've been diagnosed with something where you're gonna pass away in a short amount of time, it may be a way to fi give the line, the final, um, oh, what's a nice way to say this? Uh, no thank you to CRA. <laughs> <laughs> final thoughts? Check or correct if you have any associated corporation problems. Minor children shareholders, trusts where they tie together that aggregate investment income test. Revisit your retirement planning just in case these tax changes have actually impacted your savings and ability and your savings rate. If you have no active business income, you're retired or approaching retirement, then these small business deduction limit rules don't apply to you, but the RDTOH rules do. The TOPI rules are still in early stages, so other planning ideas are going to come out about these and there is no silver bullet solution. Compliance costs for corporations will increase because of TOPI. So if the calculations that your accountant is doing or your financial planner are doing, they're gonna take more time, and as investment income builds, they'll become more complex. And the danger is, again, that we suddenly switch from that 55.5% ideal tax rate to that 60% tax rate. The calculations are specific to your situation. So what your neighbor does, what your 
colleague does, what your friend does, can be different from your situation. Know about, but do not dwell or stress about these changes. Look for a balance in planning and look to be reasonable. Investment savings rate is only 6% less if the corporation has reduced small business deduction limit. So it's that 18.5% versus 12.5% rate. And as far as the calculations work right now, we can recover that difference in the future personally as those personal eligible dividends are paid out. So it's a timing problem with these rules again. Perfect planning is nearly impossible. Do not shoot the messenger. <laughs> so on that, what questions do you have? Yes, Terry. So those uh, companies that were affected by, like they're a partnership and they're splitting out income to various corporations and then they got hit with just getting the one small business deduction. Yep. So is that not so bad then? Or? Well, and that's where we're, we're, we're working with two different sets of rules. So that example actually is my world. So because I'm a partner with MNP, before when I was a partner with the firm before we merged, I had six other partners, seven other partners that I was splitting the $500,000 deduction limit with. Now I have 800 partners that I split the $500,000 small business deduction limit. So for my professional corporation, I pay the 26.5% tax rate from dollar number one. So on active income in that case, I'm still paying 26.5%. If I have investment income, the investment income, the only part of it for me that gets ground away is that 400 bucks that I get allocated as small business deduction limit. So on $400, I get the 18.5% tax rate. Otherwise, I'm still paying top tax rate on that active income. So it's kind of weird where we have the two worlds. We have corporation gets its own limit. These rules could apply to get 18.5%. Corporation that shares the limit gets stuck with the 26.5% rate and could have a little bit that would be applied with this new rate and may have a little bit at the 12.5% rate. And I forgot to repeat the question. So the question at the start of all of that was for the corporations that are members of partnerships and have to split the small business deduction limit, are, how are they impacted or are they benef benefited by these new rules and the 18.5%? And the answer is really not that much. What other questions? Facebook Live, any questions? No, no, they're just watching. But Beautiful. Well, if there's no other questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Terry and to uh, wrap up the rest of the presentation.